Dennis, it's always, it's always very worrying when you're being introduced. The uh, chairman talks about the fire exits and the escapes and the lifts and everything, so hopefully you won't need those. Um, so, Dennis, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, what I'd like to do is take you through um, why I think innovation, entrepreneurship and conferences like this are extremely important. A little bit then about my personal story of, of the company that I run, Allergy Standards, and particularly take you through the journey of the idea I had in medical school to so developing some intellectual property around that and then ultimately a company and then deploying that in the commercial sense in, in America. And then I'd like to just kind of go over for any potential entrepreneurs in the audience my personal story um, and the way I was a, went around uh, getting funds and, and setting up the company. And then a little bit, as Dennis mentioned, I have a role as an adjunct professor at Trinity, so just some of my concepts um, and I think the way third, third level um, educational places will interact with research and innovation going forward. So why, why, why do I think this theme is extremely important? Why do I think conferences like this are extremely important? Well, we're, we're already seeing at this general election, there's a shadow of a property crash we had five years ago. So there's been a kind of a long shadow of that. And the way I would put it is that that um, boom that we had was based on uh, almost a kind of a greed mentality on speculation. It wasn't actually about creating real wealth and within a society. And I suggest we need a new property boom within Ireland to help uh, to help the Irish. And again, loath to use the word recovery, but um, the concept is the next property boom in, in, in Ireland should be an intellectual property boom. Um, and there's actually a recurring theme in Irish literature around this concept. I think I think Irish people are great communicators, so that makes them great entrepreneurs. And George Bernard Shaw puts this very well when he talks about this concept that if we exchange as apples, we leave it just with an apple each, but if we exchange ideas like we we're going to do today at the conference, we all actually leave with those ideas and those ideas become IP and companies and ultimately wealth. Um, and as I said, there is a great theme uh, through Irish literature and entrepreneurship and here are some, some quotes here about the concept of failure being okay. And in fact, even the word entrepreneur was coined by a, an Irishman. So I think there is a great tradition running through Irish literature and Ireland, and I think we're really, we're really well positioned for that. A lot of people actually ask you to try and define what is research and innovation, and I think this is, this is a, it's a very simple way to put it, that research is the phase where you take money and you generate that into ideas and ultimately intellectual property. And then innovation and entrepreneurship is where you take those ideas, convert them into patents, licensing agreements, and then through marketing, innovation, entrepreneurship and companies, you create more value or more money in society. And that doesn't have to be generally just money, it can actually be societal impact and improving society. <clears throat> um, another way of describing innovation, and this is something I got from Daryl Mann, who was the Chief Innovation Officer in Rolls-Royce, he describes innovation as future-proofing your business. I think that's a fantastic way to describe it. If you look at Blockbuster and Kodak, uh, amazing large international companies that are now bankrupt, but Instagram is now a billion dollar company. So I, don't, I think if you don't innovate and stay with the future friends, uh, the trends of intellectual property, uh, you're going to become uh, irrelevant to society. Um, and if you look at the list is a screen grab of something from uh, Forbes magazine, this concept that entrepreneurship and innovation is the way forward for Ireland. So that just kind of summarises why I think this theme is one that I'm particularly passionate about and why I think conferences like that we're having today uh, are, are the, way, the way forward for Ireland. So if I just take you through uh, the thinking behind my company, Allergy Standards, the, the initial concept is one that I had in medical school when I was a medical student. But the next slides will, will take you through uh, the concept and as I said then how we actually develop that concept into, into a company. So the first, first thing you start with, this is a slide from the National Institute of Health and the same will come from the American College of Physicians. What, what they're describing here is how you actually manage patients with asthma and allergy. Um, and you'll see here, underpinning any medical treatment or any escalation in the treatment pathway that the physician or the healthcare professional, could be an asthma nurse, um, should always start with patient education and environmental control. So that is what the doctor is supposed to be telling any mum of a child with asthma or allergy, or anybody with asthma or allergies, is first to look at the triggers in your environment before they start you an inhaler, before they escalate from the, the blue inhaler to the brown inhaler. So that, that is what every physician is supposed to do. 
educate you and tell about avoiding trig factors and environmental control. And these, these, these uh, reservoirs, where do we find these allergens well, or trigger factors? Some of them obviously outdoor, which is much more difficult to control, but many of them are, are essentially indoor air pollution. And you'll find triggers uh, through every room in your household. A lot of them are kind of common sense things. We know about dust mite in America, be more common uh, cockroach allergen. But there's also other hidden triggers in your indoor environment, such as formaldehyde that can have gas from furniture, um, allergenic dye stuffs that are put into textiles, azo dyes. So uh, while people are very completely understand the concept, if I avoid the triggers, I'll need, need less medicine, um, or I won't have to turn up to A and E in an emergency situation. It's very hard for them to actually act on that. And if you look at what the EPA say in America, they say we spend 90% of our time indoors, and also they've identified that indoor air pollution can be four to five times more uh, uh, harmful than out, out, outdoor air pollution. So they've also identified this as being an issue. If you then look at the medical literature and what the physicians actually say, and this is a slide from uh, what the last international workshop on it, although they, they know that they're supposed to advise their patients to avoid triggers, they them say, themselves say there's actually nobody regulating this industry and there's nobody governing claims that are on products such as hypoallergenic and the, the, if you review the literature they say that hypoallergenic or non-allergenic is actually meaningless and a lot of the claims that are on products are either not substantiated or they're not substantiated by uh, valid data. So you're left with a situation where as I said earlier, mum who wants to be very proactive, uh, you see statistics like over 50% of people who arrive at an emergency department with, with an exacerbation of asthma get the wrong treatment. So they completely get the concept and want to be proactive. And there's no problem getting information. But the issue is they don't have actionable insights. So you can Google and you can get the information, but you, 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 it's very difficult to get the, wins, the wisdom and say, well, okay, now what do I do with that insight? And again, this is something that Daryl Mann says, in the little delta diagram I have there, often you'll see a kind of a delta or a division where life is almost conspiring against you. You're trying to do one thing like, like lose weight, but you can't actually act on what you know you should do. And there's always an opportunity to innovate if you, if you, can, if you can find how you can close that gap. So something like uh, smoothies or innocent food is doing that. They're helping people where life seems to be conspiring against you. So that's, that's the thinking be, behind uh, is the solution. And then if you look in the trade literature, when manufacturers themselves go and try and uh, test their products or label their products, they, they run into trouble as well. You'll see here there's a vacuum cleaner in America uh, called Oric, um, who made claims on the vacuum cleaner, but they made clinical claims that fell foul of the FDA rulings, and the Federal Trade Commission fined them with $750,000. And ultimately, the product recalls they had to do uh, put the company out of business and they've gone bankrupt. So what you have here is you've got a whole lot of factors coalescing around um, the issue of managing asthma and allergy, uh, a deficit in information, people uh, clearly identifying that there's, there's issues here and nobody's really dealing with it. So that, that, was, that was the initial kind of concept, as I said, I had as a medical student in, um, in, in the old Harcourt Street Hospital. So if there's an issue, like traditional entrepreneurship, is, is, is there an addressable market here? If you solve this problem, is, is, are you creating value and is there enough value to run a profitable business model? So if you look at some of the statistics in, in America, if you stack the, the next five most common disease conditions all together, you won't have as many people in America that have asthma, asthma and allergy. So if you run any kind of um, health economic assessment, the burden, cost, A&E visits. This is a significant societal issue. So this was the concept we came up with, and it is, it is this a logo up in the top right hand corner here. It's a certification symbol. So if you test products, we, we don't test food, because there's a lot of issues with, with, with testing food, but we test and certify consumer products that are asthma and allergy friendly. So if the product has certain uh, attributes, uh, performance criteria, suitability criteria, it doesn't contain harmful triggers, and we can test it in a scientific, scientific uh, objective, objective third-party, meaningful way, we will award that product with the certification symbol. Now, one of the things we did 
uh, reasonably early on in the business was to form a joint venture or a strategic alliance with the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. So they would be the national leading patient advocacy group um, and that allowed us to dovetail into their network, their physician activation strategy and to kind of build a brand pretty quickly in America. So if you look at how we test, we have um, various laboratories, we collaborate around the world. Uh, our main uh, testing partner is another Irish company called Airmed Health Group. And uh, there's some people in the audience from, from Airmed here today. Um, so we've designed over 20 certification standards and protocols to test products um, such as electrical appliances, so vacuum cleaners, air cleaners, air conditioners, and those types of products would go into this, this uh, climate control walk-in chamber and we would look at their impact on allergens over time, whether it's a uh, decay of allergen in the air or in surfaces, and we look at common household allergens like dust mite allergen and cat allergen. If it's a textile based product like a pillow or a um, pillow encasing or a comforter or a duvet, um, it goes through different types of tests. We look at its allergen filtration properties of the fabric. We would look that the fabric doesn't contain harsh chemicals such as fat formaldehyde and so forth. So once the, the, the products arrive at the laboratory, so you'll see photograph like 30 representative samples of pillows come into the laboratory. They're tested under the proprietary testing algorithms. They must pass every component of that. And once they pass that, they're allowed to use a certification mark under license. So if I just go through some examples um, of our clients in America, um, we generally run the, the program in America. We also run a program in Canada. And some of our clients use the certification symbol on an international basis, most notably Dyson on their new um, humidifiers use it in Japan and, and in China. So Procter & Gamble uh, in the Swiffer product range will be one of our clients. 3M furnace filters, not, not so much a big issue over here, but furnaces or the kind of central heating and ventilation system they have in America, uh, 3M uh, Filtreat will be, will be a landmark product there. Obviously Dyson vacuum cleaners and now all their air cleaners are certified. Um, and as well as, as Disney, but obviously the initial idea came in a paediatric outpatient clinic, so it's fantastic to see the idea now to actually to be licensed on the most famous toy in the world. Um, and Times Square, a lot, a lot of people accuse me of photoshopping this in and saying that this is not actually real, but that is actually a, a full weekend of uh, in Times Square of the certification mark uh, running. <coughs> Uh, LG washing machines, this is a screen grab from the Consumer Electronics Show most recently in Las Vegas. You can actually see LG have etched the logo, it's not very clear there, but the logo is actually etched onto the machine there from the factories in Korea, which is fantastic for us because it means that to actually leave the program would be very difficult because they'd have to change the doors. Um, and this is, this is a... America, eliminating an average of 94% of common household allergens like dust, pollen, and pet dander for a cleaner, healthier home. Certified, it's our new standard of clean. Call now about our $99 carpet cleaning special. They actually spent 40 million on TV advertising in America, running commercials like that. And it still amazes me, again, the initial, the initial concept of the, of the company was a small little logo to go on children's toys, and then now to see it in a full TV commercial is a bit of a, a long journey. So that's what we do um, in America, and if some of our latest research on, on it has actually shown that our original assumptions about uh, a certification symbol is actually borne out true, you'll see a lot of our consumer sentiment about issues concerned around the indoor air quality. Um, and that's something we're seeing coming more and more into consumer sentiment um, as we tighten up our buildings for energy efficiency. So if you tighten a building and you decrease the air exchange because you want to you want to have a more energy efficient building, what you bring into your environment and what outgasses from that becomes much more important. And you'll see we've also got now just around 30% brand recognition in America. So to launch a brand and to have 30% of Americans um, uh, recognizing it and, and good awareness data and attitudinal data is, is a fairly good achievement. And this year will be the 10th year anniversary of the program. 
So just to tell a little, uh, very quickly about my, my personal story, um, there's a lot of people ask me, it was unusual to be a, a medical graduate and a trained surgeon, um, and then to pivot and go into entrepreneurship. And I like to tell people that I actually think that we've, we've kind of got an obsession with the professions in Ireland, and entrepreneurship and innovation, I believe, is an equally valid vocation as continuing to be adopted. And I think we're seeing that more and more people are taking the risk um, and adopting a career of entrepreneurship and innovation and not sticking in the, in the, tradition, the, the traditional uh, professions. Uh, another point I'd like to make is no journey is, is easy. Uh, it sounds great when you're giving a presentation like this, but there's always bumps in the roads. You're often working kind of two jobs at one stage, um, and you have road bumps and U-turns and so forth. Uh, but what's really key, and again, it's, it's really encouraging to see it here today, um, is a support that's wrapped around innovation and entrepreneurship and a real true culture of entrepreneurship in Ireland. And, and just, for example, today the, there's the representatives of the third level educations, there's uh, legal companies, there's accountancy companies, there's technology transfer office. So, so I think it's obviously a, a team effort uh, and our journey was definitely supported by a lot of people, both Enterprise Ireland, Dublin City Enterprise Board and so forth. Um, there's also fantastic uh, business competitions, so if there's any entrepreneurs here in the audience, um, I would always encourage you to enter as many business plan competitions. It's a great way to road test your value proposition and your business model. Uh, this is a prize. We didn't win the total prize. It's run by Intertrade Inter Ireland, another, another great organisation. Um, there's a great diaspora of, of Irish people around the world. Obviously, Maura Gagan Quinn was the... Uh, um, the U European Commissioner for Innovation and Research, and this was some collaboration we did with the Dublin Institute of Technology, who are also here today. Um, and also to spend a little bit of time on this slide, I think it is something that's important, I know Enterprise Ireland are, are, are part of this event today, is this the concept of around St. Patrick's Day, will be coming up again, uh, we'll be travelling there around the trade events associated with St. Patrick's Day in Washington. And there tends to be a bit of bad press about this, but Ireland is the only country in the world that gets a guaranteed audience with the US president every year, regardless. China, Russia, France, nobody else has that access to the American market that we have. So every year there's a large trade delegation with SFI, with the IDA, with Enterprise Ireland who, who, who go to these events and bring our key accounts and, and do press releases. And there seems to be this obsession in the media about staying in Ireland and this is a junket. I think we, we can't, we're a small island nation with all this intellectual property you're seeing in a trade show like this, we've got to get off this island and go and sell our intellectual property and ideas around the world. And this is a fantastic vehicle uh, to do that. We, we've, we found it extraordinarily helpful every St. Patrick's Day. So that's a little bit about, about my personal journey. As, as mentioned, one of my roles at the moment now, I'm an adjunct professor in Trinity and the entrepreneur in residence there as well. So just want to just finish up briefly saying about what I think the role potentially of, of universities in, in innovation is going forward. Traditionally, it's kind of been demarcated like this, that you have within the university gates, you have Science Foundation Ireland, and that's IP, and that's all done inside. Once that's finished, it's thrown over the wall to somebody like an entrepreneur or um, Enterprise Ireland to run with that intellectual property and then you may then get IDA to, come, to get somebody in from America to collaborate with that. And it seems to be almost like one-way traffic that the ideas are generated in the university and even the names of the offices are technology transfer office and this idea of transferring stuff out and licensing it out. And I think the future really should be more collaboration and have porous walls with universities and have people from industry coming in and doing research as we, as we do uh, with innovation vouchers and so forth, but also with um, Science Foundation Ireland will sponsor uh, graduates, again something that we've done to actually do contract research with us. So I think the future is a much more open collaboration. And I'll just uh, kind of tell a story briefly about that from my point of view, so an area that I'm active in is digital health. So this is a kind of a fictitious walk that an entrepreneur could take. And I've taken it from um, what they now call Grand uh, Silicon Dock or Grand Canal Key. And I've put Google here, but we know around, around this dock here you have LinkedIn, you have Twitter, you have Facebook. They're all here. So potentially a digital health company uh, it could walk along here through the Trinity Technology and Enterprise Campus where we're based, walk a bit further up Pier Street to the Trinity Biomedical Institute, and then into the back gates of Trinity through the Cran uh, Institute, past the medical school, out the front gates, there's another institute called the Centre for uh, Patient and Healthcare Innovation, 
There's the Innovation Academy based here, up James' Street, past the Digital Hub, and then into the largest teaching hospital in the country, which is St. James's Hospital. So that concept of being of a number of institutes all collaborating together, both uh, research, medical schools, teaching hospitals, and, and large uh, foreign direct investment companies, being in such direct proximity and the ability to collaborate, I think is something that Ireland really um, should uh, avail of. And I know this type of cluster concept exists in Galway. Maybe I've gone over time, they've got, they've got, my, uh, got my microphone. So, so, so I think this is something that we really should do more of. And events like this today are, are, are kind of replications of that. But this concept of, of world-class institutions being geographic close proximity and collaborating, I think is something that, that we should do more of. I'll slip over that slide and just, just to finish up. Okay, so just in summary, just a couple of key takeaway messages. Um, clearly, I think Ireland needs innovation. I think we're, sh we're showing that we are best in the world in that area. And that true wealth creation, not greed, not speculation, real wealth creation is, is the way forward for Ireland. Uh, Maura Gagan Quinn is right that knowledge is knowledge and intellectual property is the new asset class. It is the new crude oil, and we're, we're very well placed for that. I hope in my talk I, I kind of showed you with Intertrade, with Intertrade Ireland, Enterprise Ireland, and all the work people we've collaborated with, the DIT, uh, that there is a real culture of innovation and networks in Ireland. Um, and also then with the last slide, just this concept of a very tight ecosystem and the ability to develop ideas and then go to a market like a Google or St. James's Hospital and deploy that concept very early and get feedback from the market. So just in summary, thank you again, uh, Dennis, for the opportunity to talk here. Uh, fantastic conference, and I'm actually looking forward to going to a lot of speakers myself on, on IP and digital health. And most importantly, for any entrepreneurs in the audience, uh, good luck. Thank you.